Hi, I'm George the Antique Nomad. Come with me as I wander the country in search of valuable vintage, amazing antiques, and cool collectibles. We'll buy, sell, and trade at antique malls, shops, and shows, estate sales, flea markets, thrift stores, anywhere people go to find really interesting things that just aren't made anymore. So come on, let's go. Hello viewers, welcome back. It's George the Antique Nomad. I'm in St. Petersburg, Florida, and I have a chance today to bring you a rather special and rather unique antique mall called Andrea and Friends on Martin Luther King Street. Kind of a busy street, so I've got to keep cutting off because of the car noise. That's why they're here. They are located at 24th and Martin Luther King and they are in an area that's distinct and easy to find because they've got some old-time businesses around them. Let's show you. Before the freeway, this was one of the main streets into St. Pete, and so this old gas station and garage from the 30s is still here and has been renovated into a cool consignment store. Now, they're not open today because it's Sunday, but they do some vintage as well as resale clothing, and it's a great match for Andrea and Friends Antique Mall. She actually calls it Antiques Mall, which is proper English. I met Andrea early on in my days in St. Pete because she conducts estate sales and she's also a certified appraiser, as am I. So we had that in common. She invited me to shop at some of her estate sales and then mentioned that she had this great store. I moved in as a dealer and have been here for a number of years. And as you can see, they have various specialties that make them a little different than some of the other stores in town. Now, I'm not usually a sidewalk photographer, but I wanted to show you the old hexagonal pavers because St. Petersburg was known for the hexagonal pavers in the sidewalks back in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. They started to get rid of them in the 50s because women would get their high heels caught in them when the heels became stiletto. Anyway, this is a neat old building they're in that dates to about 1930, and here is the front window. Before we go inside, because the entrance is actually in the back, I wanted to focus in on these lamps. The painting on the one on the left is very nice blue and white floral on milk glass, and it looks like it's 1940s or 50s version. The one on the right is actually an old kerosene lamp from probably 1900 that has been electrified. And that's a really beautiful Art Nouveau shade and base, also screen painted on milk glass, but I've never seen that patterning before. And this is an American piece, we can tell because the turner on the wick says made in US of A. Here's the back of the store, and this is actually where the entrance is. We're at 24th and ML King used to be known as 9th Street North in St. Pete. And let's head on in and see what's inside. The first thing you're greeted with inside Andrea's, besides very friendly help, is really wonderful costume jewelry. A nice big case of it. Actually, cases and cases of costume jewelry. This is a real specialty of this store. There's probably more costume jewelry in this store than most cities in all their antique malls combined. You can see everything from inverted Rivoli watermelon stones to butterfly pins, the Boucher fish, there's Joan Rivers. Up on the top here, you can see a very nice Chinese bracelet from the 1920s with the enamel and filigree. <laughs> Sterling jewelry is also an area of expertise for them and they have pieces that are Mexican in design. They also have Art Deco from the United States in the 1930s, and they have Navajo. Navajo jewelry and southwestern turquoise is surprisingly popular in Florida. I find that I buy pieces here during the season and they never make it to the end of show season. But they have a good selection here every day. They have the red coral polished pieces as well as various stones from all over. The ring in the back there next to the cuff with the flower on it, it's a man's ring and you can see there's a little claw set in it and the stones have very deep black lining through them. Hopefully you'll be able to see that. That makes it Bisbee turquoise 
Bisbee, Arizona is the, where the mines with the black vein turquoise are. And that is an area some people are very specific. They only want Bisbee because they like that look with the black veining. Here's a lot of 1950s and 60s pieces, and there's items as inexpensive as $15 in this case. And up from there, designer names are going to cost more typically. Shapes generally do better than round, and because it's spring, a lot of pastel colors are popular right now. This grouping shows a really large, very nicely carved cameo. You can see really good detail, and the way the shell is polished so that it reflects some of the brown in her hair ornament is really thoughtful. And the more thoughtfully made a cameo is, the better it will do in the market. And then to the left and the right are Scandinavian modern enameled pieces from the 1950s. A lot of those are by a designer named David Anderson. But there were several designers in Denmark and Norway who did this type of jewelry in the 50s. It's all very collectible now. These pins are priced, it appears, around 45, which is actually on the low side for those. But Andreas is not limited to costume jewelry. They have a really nice selection of semi-precious and fine jewelry as well. You can see smoky topaz rings. You can find garnet and moonstone, garnet and opal, amethyst, a lot of different designs. And the vintage on these is going to be anywhere from 1950s to 70s, typically. Welcome back to look at more costume jewelry, but I wanted to show this wonderful fringed Native American beaded women's coat. Look at the beading in that. It's just beautiful. Priced at $9.50 and a really great squash blossom necklace as well, as well as the sterling and malachite. There is a new museum in St. Petersburg called the James Museum of Western Art, and since that opened, there's been increased interest in Native American designs in this area. I see a pair of beaded moccasins with the pink and green stones. Those look like they would be 1940s or 50s colored beads and made somewhere in the plains. I wanted to show this piece because it is Victorian. It is brass with seed pearls and garnets. Seed pearls and garnets were inexpensive at the time. A lot of these were given as love tokens. This is a nice large one with the Art Nouveau design. And these usually sell in the 100 to $150 range now. Now there's a company named Signer that makes this costume jewelry cuff with the lions with the jade ball between them. This is not costume. This is 18 karat gold with emeralds and diamonds and rubies. That is a beautifully made piece. More cameos and they really have a nice selection. The woman in front of the cottages under the tree is unusual, but the woman to the right with the really amazing floral headdress is quite lavish and ornate. Another thing you'll see in cameos sometimes, the one on the lower left is a good example. That one has a necklace, and the necklace has a diamond chip, a rose-cut diamond. That was a certain way of cutting stones around 1910-15. Edwardian jewelry typically has this delicate filigree around it, as you see here. And that's really a beautiful cameo. The one to the right of it is a little older. That one has the Maiden walking through the snow. You'll sometimes see Rebecca at the well also. That's a very popular Victorian motif for cameos. I'm very partial to the first bracelet on the bottom here. It's got beautiful cobalt stones and diamonds and is in 14 karat gold. And at the top we have a very lovely diamond and marcasite set bracelet. We see a lot of marcasites used around 1920 in jewelry because they give the flash of a diamond and they can be cut to very small sizes so you get that bling without having to fracture diamonds into tiny pieces. We'll try to get the glare off of here, but there's a bunch of interesting hotel memorabilia in this mall right now. This one's from the Hotel LaSalle in Chicago, and the Hotel LaSalle was built in 1908 to 1909, and this one is going to be from right around the time that the hotel opened. The Gibson girls were very fond of carrying fans, partly because they were dressed in all of that regalia, and it got hot in there, so they needed a fan. Other hotel wear, these are from MySpace. 
These are local to St. Petersburg. On the left is a cafe plate, a salad size, or dessert size from the Sewanee Hotel, and it's got a great back stamp that says, Black Knight, made in Bavaria, made expressly for the Sewanee Hotel, St. Petersburg, Florida, 1930. And that's what makes it special, is that it's one of the early hotels from the hotel boom here. Florida had a huge boom in the 1920s, and the last of the big hotels that was built here is the Vinoy. Just a beautiful structure. Thankfully, it was saved. We've only lost one of the major hotels in St. Pete, and that was the Sereno, which was blown up for an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. That did not go over well. It actually led the beginning of historic preservation in St. Pete. And that's a good thing because we saved all the other hotels and it's become a great walking district and now people are moving here because downtown is a great place to walk around and see a lot of cool old stuff. The Vinoy Hotel shows various sporting activities you can do while you're here. There's the hotel itself. They show people cavorting on the beach, women in their one pieces because this is going to be from the 1920s. It's one of the first patterns they made for the hotel. In the 20s or 30s, you have canoeing and fishing, all the things people did in Florida before Disney and theme parks. And also in my space, local interest again, St. Petersburg had a fantastic drugstore that was a huge tourist attraction for about 45 or 50 years called Web City. Doc Webb started as a little drugstore and expanded and expanded and pretty soon he had the world's most unusual drugstore. Unfortunately there's only one building left from this but it had an amazing run. It covered four city blocks, it had a rooftop garden, there was a huge garden center, there is a trading post. You can see the interior there. He would sponsor all sorts of events, including Aunt Jemima coming to flip pancakes when she was a celebrity touring. He would do anything to get people in there. He did very well during the Depression when other people didn't. And he located very strategically right between what at the time was the segregated white and non-white areas of town. You can see the lunch counter here. When segregation was ended in the 1960s, and they asked Doc Webb, who was a white man from Knoxville, Tennessee, what he thought. He said, this is fantastic. I never understood why I had to pay to have two of everything. It made no sense to me. Everyone can just get along. Here's a little information about him. Nervous, dynamic, and energetic. That sounds sort of like me. <laughs> I guess that's why I relate. Unfortunately, this went away when I was a child and so we don't have it anymore, but we have this Vernon Kilns plate to remember it by. I'll go ahead and show the rest of my little space now while we're in here. I do have a modernist lamp because I really needed the light, but Andreas is more known for real antiques and primitives particularly. I brought this in because it's the turn of the century, circa 1900 litho print, and you can see there's the lifeboat, and they're trying desperately to keep the lifeboat off of shore so that they can get it out to save the people in the boat that is apparently wrecked out there. It's a very dramatic scene. I actually think this is really neat. A little cottage painting here. I have the pink pigs in the outhouse. What are you doing in there? Oh my, very immodest. These little green bowls here that you see are salt dips. And the reason for the raised edge, which a lot of salt dips do not have, is to put the salt spoon across them because you would dip the spoon in the salt and sprinkle it on your food and if the spoon got moist you didn't want to put it back in the salt because the salt would all congeal together. These practically glow without a black light. Again, I don't have my black light with me. I've got to do something about that, but if we put a black light on these I have a hunch they would glow even more brightly than they already are now. And you know, they're only $15 for the whole set. Now that we're open again, I'm sure someone will come pick those up right away. The Red Riding Hood girl is Seabus Porcelain and priced about 30. And the Hummel Madonna, I believe is 45. The Moon and Stars candlesticks in the Amberina to the right. I typically price these around 25 for a set. 
We have a couple of Yadro polar bears, priced at around 45 to 50 a piece. I got a kick out of this. This is Josephine Baker. This was done by a Philadelphia artist named Ben Knight. About 1970, he did a lot of various stars of the 20s and 30s, and Josephine Baker, of course, was so exotic and unusual and such a hit in France and did not face discrimination in France, so she moved there and most of her career was in France. Really was an incredible entertainer. I've seen old black and white footage of her and the way she danced and moved and she, she was really something. There's a Helmsine nightlight with the real photos. Helmsine was done using real pictures to make lighting and shades on plastic film that could sh still show light through it in about 1960. Because it's Memorial Day weekend, I brought in the print of Douglas MacArthur. This would have been in someone's home during the time that their son was in the U.S. Army during the Second World War. I got a kick out of this bottle. It's Duraglass, which is an American-made company, but it's full of face powder. A dealer in Miami who spoke very little English and her friend helping her said, oh yeah, she got it on her trip to Uruguay. So that's something I figured no one else is going to have. I have, hello there. I took my mask off because I look to make sure that no one's in the store. And when someone comes in, well, we'll just put it right back on, but it's easier to speak without it. I love these hanging wall mirrors because they're so great for display. You can see I deal a little bit in perfume and paperweights and elegant glass and all sorts of things. Head vases tend to do well here. This one is ceramic art studio out of Wisconsin and this one is Becky based on Becky Thatcher from Huck Finn. I have this priced at 49 she's really sweet head bases do well and ceramic art studio is really good quality I might be top end on her though. This is a majestic lamp and majestic did these really swooping interesting 1950s designs. They're very geometric. They're always fun. They often have flowers in them. The shade's a replacement, so I have it priced at 95. If it had the original shade, it'd be considerably more, but I think it's a good look. This floral chandelier came out of an estate in Sarasota, and I haven't replaced some of the bulbs because we're getting to summer here. It gets very hot in here if we put too much lighting in, so... These are Eichhardt prints. They represent all four seasons, but these are reproductions. This would have been done in the 1980s. We'll be right back with more of this video. If you're enjoying it, please hit thumbs up to like it. Hit subscribe below if you haven't already subscribed to the channel. And hit the bell to be notified of new videos. I do a new video every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern, plus bonus videos. And if you comment, if you subscribe, if you like, it really helps us and it doesn't cost you anything. So thank you for that and now back to the video. Up on the top I want to point out this cookie jar. She is Spice by Treasure Craft from the 1980s. There was Sugar who was a little white girl who was exactly the same other than the skin color and the hair being different. This was probably the first time that a company had made two pieces exactly the same with just different coloration rather than one being a caricature and the other one being the Caucasian version. So that was really nice to see and they sold well because of it. This jar is worth about $45. There's a number of Lennox and other bisque figural women from the 1980s and 90s in the case priced in the $25 to $40 range. But we do have some older pieces as well. These bowls with the pedestal are Dresden, and the flowers are hand applied. The decoration is hand painted. These came out of the Hendry estate in Tampa. The Hendrys were an early Florida family. There's even a county named after them. So it was neat to get something that had that kind of provenance, and they're priced inexpensively. They're only $65 for the pair. In the back is a rose tile. That's going to date to about 1910. There are people who are tile collectors strictly, and I have some who are just down the road here in Sarasota, so I'll have to let them know I brought that. This hair receiver is RS Prussia marked on the bottom. Hair receiver because it has a hole in the top. Why would you save hair? Well, a hundred and some years ago, you didn't necessarily live in a place where you could get fiber fill, so you saved hair because you stuffed things with it, you wove it into jewelry as remembrances, 
There were lots of pe reasons people used hair, so they didn't just throw things away then. This piece is also hand-painted and should price around 65 And then we have this cute turban head vase. This is going to be from about 1960. This is Japanese. It's a semi-porcelain rather than earthenware, and she's priced at $40. I too have succumbed to the jewelry. I try to mainly do bead strands because there's a lot of good jewelry in here, so I don't need to compete with them on the high-end jewelry. I bring in things that are a little different than what they have in the rest of the store. This shelf has a lot of Staffordshire figures, and these are original. There's a dresser box with the two figures seated atop and a little mirror in the back. That was a popular form during the middle period of Staffordshire production around the 1880s. The fellow holding the staff to the left is a spill vase. You have the figure of the hunter with the dog. Uh, a lot of them were done in pairs. You see a couple there, each holding an animal. And then they also did these little fairings. See the baby coming out of the egg on top of the dresser with the mirror. That's very strange, and part of the reason people like Staffordshire is that, well, they're pretty fanciful, and they did make some oddball things. It's not just about spaniels and the things you see ordinarily. A little bit of militaria has come into the mall, which is great to see because we don't run into this in antique malls very often. There's a Korean aviator's jacket patch, a Cuban medal, the one in the middle with the green, that's pre-Castro. This is a Michigan medal from the Spanish-American War. And you can see by the uniform and the woman in the long dress reading them that it is from that era. We don't see a lot of Spanish-American War items and there's a particular interest in them here in the Tampa Bay area because Tampa really was discovered as a result of soldiers being sent here to d embark for Cuba and then came back here and decided this was a good place to live. On the right there, this is a hard one to find. It's a German 1912 shooting badge. So this is Imperial German before the First World War. That's why it's scarce. There would have been a lot more from any time we we're at war than there would have been during peacetime. Next to that is a Warren Officer's cap badge. You'll see that's only $12, which is a good price. Cap badges don't typically sell for as much as medals. With all the jewelry, of course, there had to be accessories, and you see Chanel and Dior. Here is a vintage Trocadero by Louis Vuitton. And you have Gucci in the back. A lot of these are 30 and 40 years old, and people do collect the older designer names these days. Now, lest you think that this mall is all about jewelry and pretty things for women, well, then we get into this space. This looks like a western tack room in places. You've got this great child saddle. This one's priced at $125. A lot of people buy these just as decoration. This one's got its stirrups. Looks like something made in about 1950. Sometimes they are signed, and a maker signature can really matter on a saddle. This one doesn't have one, but if you look underneath these flaps, you will occasionally find a maker name. They can also be on the back of the saddle, behind the seat. This, of course, is a Western saddle because it has the hand grip and the support in the back for the seat as opposed to an English saddle, which does not. There's a number of fishing reels and related in the mall as well. These typically are selling in the $25 range unless they're a particularly desirable brand. The thing is, they work great. They're still usable, and they're very strong and well-made, and honestly, usually less expensive now than getting one in a fishing tackle store. Here is one of the larger samplers that I've seen. This one is Ellie Barton in Alabama, 1864, age seven. So she was learning to do this during the Civil War, and by 1864, the Civil War was coming to Alabama. So this is a very unusual piece because of that alone. Because it's the 1860s, you'll see that the letter I is ciphered differently than a J. Up until about the 1830s or 40s, in many places, the I was not done as a separate letter. And here we show that it's from the Westmoreland School for Girls. So she was sent to some sort of a boarding school, probably in order to protect her during that 
period of time during the war. And there's her signature. Because she was seven years old, there's not a whole lot of detail in this because she's just learning how to do this. Some samplers are much more detailed, but very unusual because of the size and the content and priced at 450. Here's a saddle with the stool to support it, priced at 275 for the set. Black is a little different. This would have more likely been for dress or parade rather than using every day especially because it's got the stirrup cuffs. And then here is a wall full of old tools, especially a lot of wood carving planes, block planes, little shaping planes. There's some spoke shavers up at the top, a nice railroad lantern. I see prices on these items. It looks like they're having a sale, and so I see prices on these starting about $15 and going up as high as $40 to $50. Some planes can be quite valuable. Certain types of Stanley planes that have lots of bits or are for particular purposes can be really spendy. Over here I wanted to show the Lay's Salted Peanuts. This is an old counter jar from about 1950. We see a lot of countertop jars. I don't see a lot of Lay's. The Lay's Peanuts is priced at 75 and typically 50 to 75 is what we see these jars go for. And this one's got a good graphic with the happy peanut in the middle. And if you feel the need to drain the swamp, well, you can always take swamp root and that will help with that because it is a diuretic and it will help drain everything. It says so right on the bags. This is going to date to about 1910. Dollhouse miniatures are such a collectible area now and they're a lot of fun. I didn't ever have any interest in them as a child, being a boy and all, but as an adult I see where a lot of my customers are either women who are assembling things for daughters and granddaughters, or men who like the fact that it's something they can do with their granddaughter that involves modeling and scaling things and all those sorts of fun building aspects. These date from 1930s to 1960s typically. You can see prices as little as three to five dollars on these, but some of them like the alligator textured with the telephone on it, there we go. This little table here is priced at 35. That's because it's by the Tootsie Toy Company and with that alligatoring, that maker is mainly known for little metal cars in that area. They were out of Chicago and they did doll furniture at the same time and it's hard to find. These are Russell Wright dinnerware. Russell Wright's main two lines were Iroquois and American Modern. Russell Wright and his wife Mary did a lot of the designs. These were done around 1950 originally to be very modernist and you see interesting colors like the cedar green, that's a harder color to find. This was made by Steubenville. He also did a line with Iroquois pottery. I believe I can show you that as well. The Steubenville pieces were nice looking. They were not as durable as the Iroquois, which is why he went ahead and made pieces with Iroquois and those are called Iroquois Casual China by Russell Wright and hopefully that will focus in for us. And that's Russell with one L. The reason I bring that up is because sometimes you will see these listed wrong with two L's and you might find a deal online. Look how the salt and peppers are pinched so that they're easy to hold. One of my favorite things he did is the stacking cream and sugar. Again, very logical because you have one thing to take to the table, then you have your cream and your sugar. This is pinched, it's easy to carry. He just really thought through his designs. And he designed all sorts of things. He was one of the American designers who went to the 1925 Art Deco Exposition in Paris because the Americans were snubbed by the French because they said everything we were doing was derivative. And once he and the American designers got there, they realized it was true and they came back and set about trying to make their own designs that were uniquely American and that's where Streamline Modern came from and boy did they do a good job. 
I know we have a lot of Canadian viewers, and I love going up there and shopping. And one thing I found the last time I was there was this. This is Glow Hill. These cherry colored handles are Bakelite, even though this was made in Montreal in the 1950s. They were still doing that type there, and it's a little different color formulation than we see here in the States. So it's this nice maroon color. They also did a butterscotch. Sometimes they'll say Glow Hill or Bar Mates or Glow Mates on them. This one does not have any marking, so you just have to know to look for those handles. They are popular with collectors on both sides of the border because of the modernist appeal. And this one is priced at $24. Andrea's really is known for primitives and early American furniture. This very handsome maple chest of four drawers will date to sometime in the mid-Victorian period. The top drawer tends to be larger on chests of drawers of this period. We're used to seeing the bottom drawer being the large one, but in some ways this makes a lot of sense because if you have a lot of stuff in the drawer, wouldn't you want it to be on the top where you don't have to bend over for it? It's got a really wonderful bird's eye maple backsplash. It's a little hard to see because they have a lot of items on it, but I'll take this candle mold away and you'll see that it has a very graceful curve into the top. This is more simplistic than a lot of Victorian furniture. This would have been for someone who really didn't go for gingerbreading and liked more of a Biedermeier or Central European furniture style and look. And again, Biedermeier in Germany at that time was much more elemental than most Victorian furniture and typically emphasized dark trim around lighter panels or vice versa so that you got more dimension that way. This piece is priced at 800 And you know, I shouldn't just assume that everybody's seen a candle mold. So let's take a look at this one. They were stamped of tin. They're very much an elemental design. They're not trying to be fancy at all because they're functional. You would put your tallow in here with your wick. You pour it this way. It forms the candle. The wick keeps the wax from running out. And then when you're done, you turn it back upright, wrap it a few times, and you have six candles that fall out. That's how you made your own light back in the Victorian days. If you didn't have gas lighting or access to whale oil, this was lighting, and you had to be able to make these yourself. So there were a lot of candle molds made in a lot of different designs. This one looks to be later, probably 1890s, late 19th century. It's priced at $55. It's in good shape and it's a multiple with a handle. So that makes it a little more special. Sometimes these just are four of these in a row and that's it. And you had to pick it up while the wax was cooling and hope you didn't burn your hands. So this one's a little nicer than some. We think of French ceramics as being beautiful, studied. Well, you know what? They had to make practical items too, but even they tended to have more adornment and design than most. This is a basic French earthenware with a salt glaze exterior. This jar would have been made in the 19th century. The embossed flowers are all placed by hand and then attached with slip and fired in the kiln. You can see turnings, the lines above the flowers. Unusual piece. Again, you don't see a lot of more country style French because this would have been something for the peasant class. It wouldn't have been something anyone would have thought to keep or collect. On the other hand, for the wealthy classes in France, here's this beautiful enameled Victorian box. That bright, happy yellow, it's got its original key. The feet are starting towards Art Nouveau design. So this piece likely dates to about 1890 or 1895. And my guess is that it would have been done probably by Dome. It looks most like their glass to me, but I'm not absolutely certain about that. That would take some research because these pieces are not marked. And then to the right is a very nice carved cameo shell. We think of it as jewelry and pendants and things, but actually the shells are very collectible too. Wow, there is so much great stuff in this mall. I really had no idea until I went to shoot this video how interesting the other dealer spaces were. 
and it's going to take me a little more time to edit the rest of it, so we're going to have a bonus video in a couple of days and see the second half. In the meantime, thank you so much for joining us tonight, and I'm George the Antique Nomad, at the Antique Nomad on Periscope, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, with social media posts every day and videos every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye now. Thanks for joining me again in the fun and fascinating antique community here where online meets the real world. Please click the subscribe button below, click the bell to be notified when new videos upload, leave a comment below, and hit thumbs up to like this video. Links to our online social media daily posts and our items for sale are in the description. This is George at The Antique Nomad. Bye for now!